Hello and welcome everybody to the latest edition of the Buy Round interview show. Now, we've already started talking before we've come on here <laughs> about where this interview could go. Uh, former teammate of mine with a few tails up his sleeve, uh, none other than Josh Morris. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Jimmy. It's good to see you, mate. Yeah, likewise, mate. Well, let's see where this goes. Uh, how are you, mate? What are you up to now as well? Uh, well, I've just signed on for another two years at 2GB, the continuous call team there, so... Uh, once the footy season starts, I'm quite busy with that, and then I'll have some other little jobs here and there that I that I do on the side. Um, but basically, in the off season, I've kind of been a stay at home dad. Uh, had my my little boy just turned four, and my daughter was in kindergarten last year. She's just started year one, so I've uh, been spending plenty of time with the family, mate. Um, I'm glad that school holidays are over and school is back in, and I'm sure you're probably the same. I think you echo the <laughs> the thoughts of uh, most parents out there. Fucking hell, it's a long Mate, there's seven only weeks. so much you can do without spending money. Yeah. Or having them on their iPads. Mm. Like, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's yeah, full credit to, to all those stay at home mums that, that do it and watch all their kids grow up and then send them off to school because, yeah, it's a tough ask. Yeah, I've been looking into <laughs> the cost of boarding school um, <laughs> lately. It's, it, you know what, like, people say about, you know, y- y- your football career and like, Oh, it'd be so hard, and it is, and it, and it is difficult to to you know, longevity and, and maintain that commitment as a footballer. But and tackling big hundred and thirty kilo blokes like tackling Nelson and Soft Solomon and with your couple of your teammates, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's hard. But sitting at home and managing an eight year old and a six year old. Give me the football field yeah. any day oh, yeah. of the week. That 100%, is easier 100% than dealing easier. with that. And it's like, I, I, sometimes I'm sat there going, oh, have these two got the better of me? <laughs> oh, my little fella gets the better right. of me daily. Daily, but he yeah. one smile and he's... Yeah, yeah. Oh, they can it. turn it back. Oh, yeah. They can turn it back. Um, Just with the, the, the radio stuff, the, um, the, the family stuff and some other things going on, is there any desire to coach? Because obviously you're a twin. And Brett has gone straight down the coaching pathway. And obviously, you know, you read studies on twins and, and whatnot, very similar personality types. Is there any desire whatsoever to go, go down that path? Look, I do have a desire to coach one day. Um, but like I said, I've got young kids. I know how, I've seen Brett and I know how much time coaching takes up. Like you, you thought being a player was, you know, there was a lot of time consuming there. Um, it, it's it's far more as a coach Mm. you're constantly on your laptop cutting up video uh preparing stuff for the coach then you've got to present it then you you go out and do your sessions then you've got to go back look at the video from the session cutting it so there's a lot of parts involved in coaching um i do want to do it eventually but at this stage when i have young kids i do not want to miss out on on them growing up i want to be present for them and uh until they're at a stage where i feel like uh I can step away and and potentially have the time to do that. Well, then I'll pursue it. That, that's it. It's um, you know, it, even for me, the, the older I got and and the more I got to see the work behind the scenes. I think when you're a younger player, you turn up. You obviously you, you you're thrilled to yeah, be you're there, but, ass. but you, you you don't really appreciate what yeah. goes into the coaching side of things. You just think when when you when you're towards the back end of yeah. your career and you you kind of. You have your wits about you and you see the preparation that they do because you've got to prepare as well when yeah. you get older. You got to, your preparation is is a key factor in, in you playing well as you get older and, mm. and you watch the coaches and the way they go about their work as well and the amount of work they do. You, you feel like you've got to you know, deliver for them as, as they've prepared so well. You've got to go out and you know, execute it mm. for them. And you sort of recognise the, the, the stress and the pressure and, <laughs> and also the, like... I think when when you're a young lad, you, you don't realise. You see a coach gets moved on, and you're like, oh, w- yeah. whatever. Like, oh, good luck to you. But then, I think the older you get, you sort of you recognise the impact that it has on people. And I think at roles I've had at um, the Dragons and the Bulldogs, you have a little peek behind the curtain, mm. and you think, like, th- these people, like. They, they put so much on the line, but I think they're wired up a little bit differently as oh, well. I, I think so as well. I mean, Flano is a, a key example of that. Flano was with us at 2GB and, um, you know, he had a, has a gig with 2GB and Fox and 
you know, just looked happy, no stress, but he, he still wanted to get into coaching. Yeah. And we're like, mate, what are you doing? You, you, you do it, you're like, you're doing far little, far less than what yeah. you'd be doing coaching and you're enjoying it. So why don't you keep doing yeah. it? And he goes, because I just want to, I just want to do it. I've just got it in my head that I want to keep doing it. And they, well, you think about that. So you've got the structure of calling maybe two games a week, radio and f and with television, you know, a few bits and pieces here and there, easy life, but then the chaotic nature <laughs> of coaching. Like, look at Flannan, where he's, he's, yeah. he's swapped his, his comfort for that role now of, like, dealing with, mm. you know, player recruitment, players being injured. Man managing. Man managing, like, just... But, but, Although, but, but I reckon he, he's happier he, and he's, he's, more, he's more comfortable yeah. in the chaos than he would be. I think man management is quite a lot easier these days. I don't think the players drink or go out as much as what the players would have when he first started coaching. No, that, that's true. But I and think social media has, has a lot to do with that. What, I, yeah. think, I think the players um, do go out, but they're a lot more apprehensive these days. Yeah. Whereas when we kind of first started coming through, there, there wasn't that kind of um, you know, spotlight on you to say yeah. so. But I, but I say, I reckon the man management and the people management now is become more... Well, oh, 100%. You, can't, you can't listen to what these people say on social media. It, mm. it would become that, like, well, what's up, mate? Like, you, you seem a bit down. Oh, this person said I'm, I'm shit. <laughs> well, who? I don't know. Underscore at Billy fucking <laughs> Billy Bob Teeth. <laughs> why why do you Dick care? Dick Dave's, mate. Why, why do you care about what he's saying? <laughs> oh, look, Piff underscore 904 said, you know, yeah. I, I shouldn't be playing. Yeah. Well, the the people management the man management skills I reckon now it's shifted from here's some advice to live by and more around the fact of like you've got a you're almost you're almost a psychologist yeah a little bit yeah for sure yeah be interesting to see you coaching being with all your psychology <laughs> I learned from the best Desi mm. oh god <laughs> um, well mate but be, being a we spoke about your your, your twin brother Brett. Um, what was it like growing up as a twin? Uh, always for, always it's fascinates the best. me. It's the best. You, you had a best mate. You, you're always doing something together. You were always keeping each other entertained. Um, I don't think we fought too much. I mean, we were just obsessed with footy. It was just get up in the morning, play footy. One on one. Yeah, one on one. one. And then obviously we had our older brother, Scott, who used to, we'd go two on one versus him and... Um, till about the time we were about 11 or 12, he'd, he'd pretty much hammer us. And then once we got a bit older, the table started turning and he started getting <laughs> his fair share back, which was good. But, um, mate, we were, we were terrors. Um, you know, there were no iPads back then. Mm. Uh, if we didn't have something to stimulate us, we were destroyers. Um, we set a kitchen on fire by putting newspapers on a stove that was that was the day my brother was supposed to play his first game of footy and he didn't get there because we burnt the kitchen down another time my grand well, hang on whoa you can't just leave it there what what who put papers on the stove we put newspaper what, on the on stove purpose? yeah that's just why well we would like by act like this as is, in we were three or four year old this was what i mean we were destroyers Three or four years old, we oh, right. burnt down the kitchen by putting newspaper on the stove and turning the stove on so the whole kitchen went up. <laughs> Our granddad looked after us one day and he must have done, he was doing something else. And me and Brett went into one of the bathrooms, took the toilet top off, pulled everything out of it and flushed it and it flooded the whole top floor and underneath. Um, there are instances where mum tried to lock us in, the, in our bedroom and we kicked the door off the hinges and... Um, but yeah, everything we did, we did together. Yeah, margarine, all like painted the walls with margarine. Like she's got all these stories that she tells my daughter mm. now. My daughter just laughs at him. She's like, "Nanny, tell me another story." Mm. But for Mum, it would have been horrible. But growing up was fun. It was, but it was always footy. We always were playing footy, um, and that was just you know we were so passionate about it. We loved it. Mm. And obviously with the. Uh with, with your father being um, a legend of the game as well, did was there a, a weight of expectation as you were, you know, the, 
the backyard football, but then coming through the grades, w w did you get a, s a sense that people were watching be because you because your dad played? Oh, look, I think there were times when we were a bit younger that we we didn't realise it at the time, but people were kind of pigeonholing us into certain things, saying certain things like you're only here because your dad and stuff like that. And um, me and Brett never had to deal with any of it because we we're too young to realise. When you get a bit older, you kind of realise that a little bit, but... In a sense, it kind of, um, you know, lit a fire in our belly to, mm. to go out and prove people wrong. Um, yeah, become your... Yeah. yeah. It was not about living in Dad's shadow. It was about stepping out and creating our own. Um, and we, we managed to do that throughout our career. But, um, you know, when we first got in, into the young grades, it was I didn't make the, my first Steelers rep side until I was 18. Brett was the year before. But it was like, all right, let's, let's give this a shot and see see how far we can go with it and let's always just continue to push each other not let's be competitive let's try to be one and two in everything that we do and it wasn't um an unhealthy rivalry it was a very healthy rivalry and it got the best out of both of us uh and when we when i eventually moved um it only drove us to to higher levels because the only time that we were able to play together were was in rep sites so it worked out very well for us and um, I guess, you know, now um, having finished our career, I think we both created our own shadow and, and stepped out of that and that's something that we're probably very proud of. Yeah, and, and so you should be. Um, you, you spoke there about coming through. You were both at um, the Dragons together and sort of making your way. You were probably more of a, a centre than Brett was a winger. Obviously you had um, Matt Cooper and, and, and Gaznia there. You, you played a, a couple of games in first grade, but then you know, Wayne Bennett sits you down and you and you find out you're going to be going on to Pastures New. And it's leaving, you know, your hometown club would be difficult anyway. But then when your twin brother's there, how did you sort of digest that news as a, as a what, a 19, 20-year-old at the time? Uh, no, I was a bit, a bit older. So I debuted in 2007, so... I would have been turning 21 that year, but I played the whole year at fullback. So Brett was supposed to be fullback, but he was injured. He ended up doing his shoulder. I ended up playing the whole year at fullback. Then the next year I played round one fullback and then got moved to the wing. And then throughout the year I got moved in and out of the centres. Um, and that was kind of where I thought my best football was going to be. I, th I knew that I was... Um, a good attacker in that position but I, I really thought that defensively I was you know really good at, at, at defending in the centres um, you know had Mary McGregor there he was our strength and conditioner and he was kind of my mentor as well and I know he was pushing a lot for me to to, to play in the centres and potentially move other players around but at that stage we had the two New South Wales centres in, in Gaz and Coops and um yeah, Brownie was coach at that stage and I was looking at re-signing. I actually had a, a deal pretty much in the works and then Brownie um, ended up getting sacked and, and Wayne came in. I never had a meeting with Wayne. Um, I was I remember I was on the golf course and I, I rarely ever played golf and I had a, a miss, miss number. I didn't know who it was, as you do. You, you kind of let it go and then... You never answer a call for and then. don't know. Uh, about 10 minutes later, my manager called me. So I picked up and he goes, oh, I've got some bad news. Um, Wayne thinks you're a winger and then said that my contract had been halved. And he goes, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I'm, I'm not a winger. I said, oh, let's let's look at some options. And um, there were a couple of options on the market and one of them was the Roosters and one of them was the Bulldogs. And... Um, I was very close to signing with the Roosters, actually, and then Anthony Milicello um, had a serious back injury and they ended up re-signing a couple of um, outside backs. So I ended up at the Dogs and uh, I, I spent 10 years there. I'm, I'm a life member there and, um, you know, very proud that I was able to play for such a great club for so long. So um, it was disappointing when that happened. I, yeah, I was heartbroken. I mean, I was a, a Dragons junior. I grew up on that hill watching the Dragons go around and lived out my dream getting to play with some of my favourite players. Um, but that is kind of when I realised that football is a business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you try and be as loyal as you can, but at the end of the day, you can only be so loyal as, as they are going to be. And 
um, yeah, so that that kind of opened my eyes to to the whole world of, of football being a business. Mm. When you say there about um, wanting to become a centre, it's very interesting. So I, I've got this opinion that centre is the easiest <laughs> job in the game. I remember having lots of conversations mm. with you about like, this. You it. And then the gaff would come up and, and say, don't listen to him, mate. Yeah. It's the hardest position on the field. Well, <laughs> I reckon it's the easiest conditioning-wise, conditioning wise, but it's the hardest to read defensive. And again, I have no... I, basically, that's from, from speaking to other people around the traps because I don't know what it's like to play in the centres. But I want to get you to, to talk to us because I find this really interesting. You, you're an amazing attacking player. Like you, you scored tries for fun, but I think your best quality was defensive work. And the, I always knew that your side, if the other, the other, if the opposition had a gun centre, you were going to be all over them, and you took it personally. I think that's the interesting psyche about centres as well. Is it's probably the only one-on-one battle where it can be personal. So the middle forwards go up against each other, but it's a pack mentality, mm. like. I've got a couple of people with me. I can't just focus on one. Yeah, there can be that alpha v alpha thing going mm. on in the middle, but generally speaking, it's a pack v pack. But I think centre, there's that psyche of like, I need to beat my opposite here. Mm. So can you talk to us a little bit about that psyche and a little bit about what makes a good defensive centre or good defensive re? Is it your system? Is it your experience? Vision? Can, can you talk to us well, about think, those I two questions? I think it's all of those things. I think... It, Experience does help, um, but I think one of the, the main things is is communication. It, it, you have to be an effective communicator when you're tired. And the first thing that goes out of someone when they're tired is their talk. And I always prided myself on being a, a really good communicator and a clear communicator under pressure. And I had my half. And I knew that if I told him to do something, he would do that. And then I would do the same. I would like follow whatever he was doing and, and my wing would follow me. Um, to be fair, I did a lot of um, video on, on the opposition as well. And De- Des was always big on video. Um, and you know, that helps in your psyche as well. If you feel like you can go out on the field and know what exactly that player is going to do, and feel like you know them better than they know themselves. It gives you an extra confidence in your Mm. ability to to defend them. Um, I I think as a centre as well, it's not just about the centre as well, it's about the the, the halves and the fullback. You've got to try and create doubt in their mind as well um, with your types of reads and pressures. Um, You don't necessarily show your hand, um, but you, you want them to try and make a decision rather than you giving them the, the decision, if that makes sense. Yes. So, I mean, if you're turned in, they're going to they're gonna read that as in you're going into jam yeah. and they're going to play out the back. If you keep your body square and don't give them any reason, then so they're going to they're, they're gonna have to make a decision. And, and if you have decent inside pressure, which a lot of the clubs do these days, not, not everyone did it when, mm. when we were playing, it's, it's become a massive thing, the inside pressure on the halfback. If you have effective pressure on the halfback, they have to make the decision. You're not giving them the decision. And I, I feel like um, as a centre, I kind of had a, a good mix of being able to um, jam, being able to s- hold my, my space or being able to, you know, let my winger go and then cover around the back for him. Uh, and that all comes with experience. But I think the main thing was effective communication under pressure. Were you looking for cues at all? Is that a big thing, like just yeah, slight angle of the shoulder? Yeah, you know, certain foot forward. You know, where the like, well, I think know, shape of the ball, like, in and I'm thinking, Josh, it, it's easy to sit and talk about these things, but when when the ball gets shifted out wide and things are going so fast and it's and it's a hundred miles an hour and you've got so many different options, how can you stay calm in that moment to pick up on the cues? And know what the opposition's going to do. Well, it's it's just repetition and trust, trust and belief in yourself. So you're not actually thinking out there, are you? You're not, or or, or sorry, we, or are you? You are, you are, you are thinking. But like you said, with the amount of um, video analysis and stuff like that, you do 
tend to learn players' tendencies and stuff like that. And But you're also kind of scanning. You, you're scanning where the ball's coming from. You're looking up in front of you. You're seeing which players are in front of you. You look, you're identifying the threats, but then you're also thinking, all right, if this goes out the back, can I get him or do I need the winger to come and get him and then I cover the winger? These are all things that you've got to be able to communicate on the go. Mm. And you only learn that through repetition and you get more and more experienced at it. But as I said, I just found that um, yeah, effective communication when you, when you are tired and gassed was was one of my biggest strengths. And sometimes it talked the opposition out of it. Like if you saw them, they were thinking about coming down a short side and if you're screaming, 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 they go, nah, nothing's on here. Yeah. They'd go the other way. So you could almost outfox them in that sense as well. And you've got to be able to trust your, your inside and your outside man. Uh, I mean, I had Trent Hodkinson as my half for a number of years and um, – yeah, he was one of the best defensive halfbacks I, I defended along. So I knew if if there was a 110 kilo second roller that was running as hard as he could at Hocko, he would get under him and he would do his job and that allowed me to have the confidence to go and execute whatever I needed outside me. Yeah. So it does come a lot to, to down to trust as well. And you see that a lot of times. You see the winger miss his mark and then the centre looks at him and goes, what, like, what are you doing? And it's it, that's it. It's just trust and communication. Mm. So, the trust, communication under pressure, talking people out of it. But that one-on-one -on -one battle, that personal battle, mm. you classic example with GI. He frightened the living daylights out of most defense uh, senses. But you seem to have him <laughs> under. <laughs> I, I oh, well, no, but, but, but he probably got the better of me a lot of times. But I knew. That if I could do a job on him and limit the damage um, that he would create, if I did a, a, a good enough job, would be in the game. So, mm -hmm. I mean, he was a, a a big presence, and I was a left center, and he was a left center. But for Origin, I always got put over. Well, I think I played two Origins on the left. I played, you know, predominantly on the right for that, and it was for that reason to try and shut down his time. And that was the same thing. I would, in Origin, I would have to watch not only him, where he was, but, you know, how wide he was standing, what his halves were doing, watching, you know, blokes like Thurston and, and Smith and Billy and them communicating to him to try and get him the ball early. And I had to try and sense that and get up in his face, get close enough to shut down that, that big fan, which inevitably, mm. um, you know, he got, we, got me with a couple of times. But I also had to be extremely strong. I, I, I had to go into the gym and lift, you know, very, very heavy weights. And I, I would do certain exercises and people would look at me and go, what are you doing that for? And I'm like, well, this is what GI weighs, so yeah. I'm just trying to, you know, wrestle with that <laughs> so mm. in a sense. And doing that kind of stuff would get you confident as well. But, um, yeah, that was one one job I really – you know, enjoyed and looked forward to and knew that if I could do my job well there, we, we, we'd stand a chance of winning a game. Mm, yeah, shut down their, arguably their biggest threat. It, did you take it personally with, you know, Greg Inglis or other or, or one-on-one centres? Did you feel like there was more of a personal responsibility to get over your opposition number? Oh, I think I felt that nearly every game. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, you, you pride in your performance. if. If everyone goes out and tries to beat their opposite number, well, then you're going to win most but, but football games. I think there is more of a, like I say, a sense of that in the centre position mm. because it is, you, you know. Well, it, yeah. It is well, the, you, and, and even now, as, you, and, you look, when I was you playing look at and footy an observer and, and, of football, and trends think, now, most of those tries are scored in those 20 mm. channels. So it's it's either the centre scoring them or, or setting them up along with the fullback. So, yeah, if you do overcome them, um, you know, You've got a good chance of winning the game, but yeah, look, I, I went out to try and um, to try and dominate my centre each week. It is it's obviously you speak about the battles with with GI at Origin, and we're going to talk about that that tackle that you, you you made that day, and 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 a little bit about the psyche and getting up and continuing on. But is there is there another player that springs to mind that you felt you really had to elevate yourself for when coming up against them? Oh well, Justin Hodges was was one as well. Um, you know, I 
in in club land, I played left centre as well. So um, Jamie Lyon, another one. Um, you know, when we were, he was probably a little bit different, wasn't he? Well, yeah, he was. You know, more skillful. He had he had the attributes with the flick and the kick and and stuff like that. Um, you know, obviously Justin had had a big body, had a a, a good step, and um, but yeah, those blokes were obviously older than me. Um, you know, they were experienced. They'd played at the highest level. So um, as a young fella, you wanted to go out and get the better of them, and. Um, yeah, th- so those I guess those types of quality centres um, w- were types of battles that I really looked forward to and enjoyed. Do you think that that personal one-on-one battle is the reason you got up in Origin when you've been told your knee is gone? Uh, yes and no. I think there's a little bit of a backstory to that one as well. I mean, uh, I don't know we've it gets talk talked about a lot more. My getting up off the ground, but that was only to go and protect Brett, who had a broken shoulder as well um, mm. in that 2014 game. I mean, that was after eight series losses, and it's a it's a hard one. You, you know, I didn't play in all of them, but you know, I played in a number of them where we'd lose by a field goal in one game, and we'd we'd, we'd lose the series two one, and and people like, well, why can't you just win? And we're playing arguably the best Queensland side of all time, but in that. 2014 series, um, yeah, we kind of had a um, a tagline of, of whatever it takes. And uh, I think you saw it in – it was a reflection of our team in that game one. Um, it was the 100th origin. It was up at Suncorp. Arthur Beetson had just passed away and Queensland retired his jersey for that game. And they said, we're, we're going to go and play for – we're playing this game for Arthur. And we went, well, that, that's good. Let's see how much – you know, you, you care about him because we're going to do whatever it takes to win this game of footy. And um, Brett scored a try in about the 18th or 19th minute, dislocated his shoulder. Uh, I've, I've come up to him and looked at him and I'm like, there's no way he can stay on here. He was in agony. And sure enough, he got up and, and you know, his, his, his words are, well, I looked at the bench. We had three, uh, four forwards on the bench. I'm playing on the wing. It's a specialist position. No one knows it and no one can do it better than what I could do it with a, with a busted mm. shoulder anyway. So I'm just going to keep going. And, you know, that kind of inspired everyone to keep going. And for myself, I injured my knee and then there was a stage in the game where I, I let them know that something's, something's not right here and the, the physio managed to get around the, the, um, the other side of the field. And I kind of, it was a nothing play. So I've kicked the ball and it's gone dead and I've, rushed off to have a get her to have a look at me and I'm kind of watching the play kind of listening to to what she's saying and I'm watching and I'm, I'm looking at Thurston I'm looking at at Smith I'm looking at Slater they're like get GI the ball get GI the ball and she's like mate I think you've done your ACL and I'm like yep whatever and then I've just gone that nah, I've got to get up here and got up and sure enough made the tackle got back into the line managed to stay out there for another set or two but luckily we had a bloke like Luke Lewis who you know, dead set origin player, one of the best players that I've played alongside. He was able to come out and do that job. But then with a couple of minutes to go, Brett makes a tackle on Darius Boyd with his busted shoulder. And the, <laughs> he said that that part didn't hurt. If you actually watch the tackle, you watch Bo Scott come and fly in mm. and, and absolutely cream him. And, um, yeah, I still remember winning that match. And um, it was probably the longest we've ever had to wait for a coach to speak because everyone in that dressing room was was gone. Bo Scott walked in uh, and and collapsed from exhaustion. Um, Anthony Watmow had torn his bicep um, and there were just blokes scattered all over the, the dressing room floor. But you know yourself, when you're in one of those games and you come away with the win, there's no better feeling. And, um, yeah, that that's, um, that's coming up on 10 years and – um, just recently, Madge got us in to kind of talk about that a little bit as well with their with their players, which was, you know, it brought back some really, really great memories. Yeah, I, I bet it did because, you know, it's been a, a long drought, a very long drought, mm. hasn't it? And oh, how much does it mean to you to to be part of that winning series and and and, and break the the mm. continuation of the the Queensland dominance for a period? There? Yeah. Oh, mate, it's. It, it's great to be a part of. Obviously, we would have liked to have been there in game two. Um, you know, we handed out the jerseys game day, which was a pretty special moment as well. Um, but 
yeah, it, I, I guess it was it was you know pure joy, but it was also relief as well. Um, yeah, there were blokes there like myself and Brett, Gail, Birdie, Louie, Ryan Hoffman that had been there, you know, Jared Hayne, that had been there for a number of years and had just you know gotten so close but just didn't have that success and we finally got it. And to be able to do it in Sydney, um, yeah, that was that was our centre. And to do it with a couple of my best mates there as well, obviously Grubb and, and Hocko were in the side as well. Uh, and alongside, you know, I had Brett there as well. So, um, yeah, that was yeah, that was you know, probably looking back on it now, probably one of the greatest moments in mm. our in our career. Mm. What, what are you planning for the ten year anniversary for? <laughs> well, that's what I, I I said to him. I said, surely, Loz, surely something. We need we need to do something. So, New South Wales Rugby League, if you're watching this, come <laughs> on. We're going to take a quick break from the show to talk about AG One. Taking care of your health isn't always easy, but it should at least be simple. That's why for the past three years, I've been drinking AG1 every day, no exceptions. It's just one scoop mixed in water once a day, every day, and it makes me feel focused and ready to take on every day. That's because each serving of AG1 delivers my daily dose of vitamins, minerals, pre and probiotics, and more. It's a powerful, healthy habit that's also powerfully simple. Healthy aging doesn't need to be complicated. It certainly shouldn't feel complicated. That's why sometimes when you're taking all sorts of mixes of pills, potions, powders, supplements, whatever, it can become exhausting. But just one scoop of AG1 every single day covers all my nutritional bases. It helps support my mental and physical health, which are so important to me and I don't need the hassle that can be part of the mental health issues. So in just 60 seconds every morning, I know I'm giving my body exactly what it needs and setting up my sustainable habits for the long run. If there's one product I had to recommend to elevate your health, it's AG1. That's why they've been a partner of the buy round for so long. So if you want to take ownership of your health, start with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3 and K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase exclusively at drinkag1.com forward slash buy round. That's drinkag1.com forward slash buy round. Check it out. You speak there about playing with some of your, your best mates and obviously your brother Brett but you played against them as well. What was it like the the first time you were lining up against one? Well, I, I don't know if it was in a trial, if it was in the proper match where we had the um, muck around the, fight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was that one was, of, that, that, that was, was pre-planned, w- right? No. Oh, no. No, wasn't. that wasn't pre-planned at all. I had no idea it was him behind me. I just sensed that it was and then just turned around and started pretend- pretending to throw them and he, he did the same thing back and... Um, I remember it was just before half time, so Kevin Moore was our coach at the stage and he didn't see it. He was walking down to the to the tunnel to give us an address and he goes, What happened? What like why is the crowd going mad? I said, Oh, me and Brett just had a muck around fight. He goes, Fuck, that would have been hilarious. And I remember Matt Chechen was the referee too. He's like, Oh, you two cut it out and we've kind of pulled away laughing and then he's kind of walked away and had a bit of a smile on his face and Staggy was there as well. He had a bit of a laugh. But um you know, people still talk about that. Mm. Still talk about that, but um, yeah, it, I mean, the first time we played each other against each other, my older brother was sending text messages throughout the week, like who's going to mm. be number one in the house, and he's like, just Brett said, Brett said you're going to have a shit game. <laughs> this is what he said to me, and then he'd say the same thing to Brett. So there was a little bit of a build up, but I, we played our first game against each other in. 2009 I didn't beat him until 2012 really so and then after that I think I beat he beat me for three years and then I think I beat him for three years so um yeah it was but it was always good like you always wanted to, to get up over them and but we always kind of found each other on the score sheet as well um I remember when we played him down at Wynn Stadium and I made a break he was playing fullback and he thought I was going to run to the corner and try and outrun him because he always used to say he was faster than me. I'm like, mate, you're not faster than me. I said, I'm five kilos heavier. I'm heaps faster than you. 
and we'd just cheer each other up like that. So he thought I was going to make a beeline for the corner and I started heading towards the corner. So he's he's just chased and all of a sudden I've just done a big left foot step and he's just going, oh, no, <laughs> like that, and stuck his hand out and I've just looked back at him like that and just gone sucked in, scored under the post and he's like, you're a dog, you were supposed to run for the corner. I said, I want to do that when we get two points under the post as well. So that was that was a good laugh as well, but um, that, that, that made, it just made us play better mm. when, whenever against each other, and um, always brought the best out of us. Yeah, um, you say you're making a, a name for yourself at the Dogs as one of the best centres in the game. Uh, you spoke about Coach Kevin Moore in 2011. Um, he was sacked. Jim Dimmer comes in. You're a representative player, um, and they put you in New South Wales Cup. How do you react to that? Oh, I mean, because as, because as yeah, well, at the was, time I've, looked, a, I've looked at the it team. It was a bit of a weird, and there's some other players that yeah. maybe perhaps they could have sent a message to, but you're the guy yeah, yeah, that yeah. they they sort of drop yeah, to so, put to put everybody else on notice. You're the the fall guy, which you know you can sort of look around. But well, hang on, this guy's not playing well. Oh, I'm obviously engrossed in what's going on at the dogs because mm. i'm watching from afar mm. back in england i've already signed there and i'm like oh this seems a, a a bit of a strange statement to me it was it was and i kind of felt that way a little bit as well i felt like there were probably some players that were probably playing a little worse than what i was but at the same time it was like all right well it is what it is i can't change it now all i have to do is go down there and try and play my best and get back into the into the side and then we'll see how long it takes to, to get back. And um, the good thing was Justin Holbrook was the, the coach of the Reggies then. They had a pretty a pretty good side back then as well. And um, I remember him just saying, mate, just, um, you yeah, know, I'm not going to coach you how to play footy. I, I just want you to come down here, um, work on some things that Jimmy's told you to work on and, and have fun. He goes, I want you to have fun and enjoy your footy. And um, I think the first week we played uh, at Wentworth, Phil, and I think they may have been coming second. And we ended up beating them, I think it was about 50 to four or something. I got a hat trick that day. So I was like, oh, yeah, I should be, should be back in the side with a performance like that. And Jimmy goes on the Monday, no, nah, mate, you, you're still down there. And I was like, oh, okay, no worries. And um, then we, the next week I think we played um, – Western suburbs, I think, and that and they were one of the low, lower place teams. And I think at the stage the, the Reggie's boys were coming first or second, and we were down by ten with four minutes to go, <laughs> and we ended up winning on the bell. And um, so that was two two differing uh, two differing weeks of footy. And um, but then I managed to get back in the side, and um, we managed to kind of finish the season off pretty strongly. And um, I ended up getting called into the to, to the um, Four Nations side and going away on tour, and um, it's kind of funny. Me and Jimmy have a laugh about it now. I said, you, "You're the only bloke who ever dropped me in my career," and he goes, "Oh, look what it did! It got you in the Australian <laughs> side." So we kind of have a laugh about it now. But yeah, you know, I, di- I didn't hold any grudges towards Jimmy for doing that. I knew as a head coach he needed to to, to set an example. I was just a player he mm. he made the example of and. How I reacted to that was going to determine how the rest of the year played out as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think that there's plenty of people that would kick stones and and think, well, obviously you'd, at the time you'd, you'd already played for Australia, you played for your state as well. Um, you know, attitude of perhaps I'm, I'm too good for this, but you didn't. Just in and around that time, I, like I say, I was watching from afar and not really too sure about what was going on. Did you have any sense about what was to come? No, no. In terms of Desi coming along, mm. yeah, no, no. That were uh, that was um, completely left field. I remember being on tour. We're in Berlin. We had a few days off, and we went to Berlin for a, for a team uh, team getaway, which was quite enjoyable. But I remember Chucky Watmeyer going to Daly. Have you heard the news? And he goes, "What?" And he goes, "Desi's gone. They just won the competition." Mm. And he goes, "What do you mean he's gone?" It's like he's gone with the Bulldogs. I'm like, what? And they're like, yeah, he's gone to your club, your dog. And I'm like, oh, I didn't know anything about it. Like, mm. but I was like, that's good for us though. <laughs> and it was just, yeah, I, I just, 
did not see that coming at all. And um, but you know, you, you kind of felt a little for Jimmy because you know Jimmy had earned the players' respect in that sense, and uh, most players thought that Jimmy was going to yeah. be going to be the head coach. But um, you know, Desi coming along off the back of a premiership, you're like, well, you know, now it's now it's getting serious. Let's. Let's see where this goes. Yeah. Um, you speak about that that Aussie tour that you got picked on. Uh, that's where we first met um, when you, you when you brushed me, um, <laughs> <coughs> which I'm sure you no, remember. No, you um, had your headphones in. It was before – was it before the final? It was before yeah, the final. Yeah, you're sitting there all serious and I'm on the fi- – I'm not even playing. Mm. Is it – Mate, as if you would have said hello to me. I'm but you brush you <laughs> brush me. You're the pet. I'm coming to your club, the Bulldogs. You thought you'd come over and say hello, mate. I yeah. know what you're like pregame. You don't. Well, like you didn't know disturbed. then. I wouldn't have been. I'd have just been like, oh, hey, mate. I'll see you next year. <laughs> <laughs> but I still, I'm still pretty adamant that you brush me. Nah. Um, you, but, you beat by Dre and thinking uh, you were the maddest. Dog I ever. did. I beat by Dre then, didn't I? Jesus, I wouldn't. <laughs> Were you listening to, to, to be a fair, podcast? To be f- no, no. In, in two thousand and twelve, <laughs> well, two thousand and eleven, I don't even know if podcasts were a thing then. They would have been, but um, by the way, those Beats by Doctor Dre, they were free. I did not buy them. We were given them in camp. I would not be. You don't pay for anything. Well, I, I, I wouldn't put, spend three hundred dollars on a pair of headphones that are a bit trendy. I'm not a trendy <laughs> guy. Um, Bulldogs twenty twelve. I arrive. Um, and what was going on, I thought was normal. So things like the Jout sessions, <laughs> Johnny Novak, our mind coach, um, the the like the insanely the dojo, long videos, the wrestle dojo, the, the 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 long field sessions. Like I'm I've come in and I I'm thinking I know the NRL is probably going to be a step up in terms of preseason. I obviously had the heat factor as well, but I'm looking around going. This is, and I thought for everybody else it was normal, but it was clear that there'd been a jump yeah. in, in, in intensity, volume, and seriousness at the club, right? Yeah, I, I think so. And and the, the sports science behind it all, like Des was, was big on that and, you know, GPS data had kind of only just come out mm. like in the last – two or three years but he was massive into it and meters per minute and all that kind of stuff like game simulation stuff at Canterbury we always prided ourselves on our our fitness we would always um you know do some pretty tough pre-seasons and there'd be lots of lots of running and but Desi came along and it was it was hard it was long but they're also lots of like endurance speed endurance sessions mm. all these different types of tests that he would have and he'd have the the watt bike test and the vo2 testing and you know, i still remember blokes f- collapsing he'd <laughs> yeah, blokes well, would be collapsing running with the mask mm. on and you know that lactic acid test on that watt bike seeing blokes yeah on the ground like just that was that was a different type of training but you just knew that it was going to pay dividends and just the professionalism around it as well. Like you just knew you had to change your attitude towards your training and your preparation. And the big thing with Des is accountability. You have to be accountable for the way you train. You have to be accountable for the way you prepare for the way you play. And that was something that kind of flicked us from Mm. being, you know, that around – that eighth or ninth, tenth posi- position to you know a top four team mm. within a preseason. Yeah, do you think that's what led to you, to your personal career best form? Uh, yeah, I think so. I, I think the the way he prepared us each week as well. Like I said, the the amount of video and that, that was new to us as well. That the the in depth video analysis. I remember like just sitting in some mm. sessions, going, "Wow, this." This is a lot to digest, but once you had, you'd go out onto onto the ground and onto the field, knowing the opposition better than they knew themselves, and just having that in your mind immediately made you a better player. Yeah, there was a, the, it, it was well I, again for me a noticeable difference, and it wasn't too long until I realised that you know, well, everyone else is what noticeably different. As some well. some of the blokes though, poor Chris Nanny knew. Yeah, he was a. 
He, he sighed, didn't he? There's the some... amount of times he fell asleep. Yeah, those oh. video sessions were bloody And Dale. Long. Dale used remember, to get... I remember Cassiano to, falling asleep. Yeah, he used to ask Dale, Dale questions and Dale would answer it. He'd go, it's a rhetorical question, Dale. It doesn't have an answer. Oh, <laughs> he used d- to rattle him. <laughs> do, do you remember the... Um, <laughs> obviously, there was a defensive system. <laughs> uh, it was blue. So, basically, yeah. the call for the outside backs backing off like on a short yeah, side yeah. would be blue, blue. Yeah. and he asked uh, I'm not going to mention his yeah, name yeah. but he asked a certain player um, that was you know trying to make a way in first grade or oh, what defence are we in here and he didn't know the answer and he just saw quiet and then I think it was Tim someone Tim, Tim, Tim Brown whispered in his ear in his ear oh it's Brown and he just goes <laughs> uh, Brown <laughs> and obviously Des wasn't looking for the answer Brown he was looking for blue and he he went absolutely red. lost his shit. Yeah. He went bananas. Uh, I think that was basically the end of that young lad's career. Yeah. There and then. Oh, I, I still remember the one of the first times Desi went off and I was like, holy crap. Like mm. in a video session and you just like, like he'd, he'd be all calm. Yeah. And then all of a sudden just like just go off the, and you're just like, wow. But, yeah, like I, I was speaking to, to someone um, about him and they're like, now that he's at the Titans and you know, he's, I think he's handed out a couple of sprays and that. And I said, well, you got what you got to realise about Dates is it, it's not personal. Yeah, he's doing it for for your development and the betterment of your development. And um, no one's immune. That's no. the best thing about it. No one's immune to it. Yeah, everyone got a, everyone got their, <laughs> their sprays from time to time. It it was a, a really positive period there. We yeah. We, we, we changed a lot of things, made two grand finals in three seasons. We couldn't quite get over the line. Made the playoffs for a couple of seasons after that, but then it was a, a pretty big fall from grace and the, the club are still um, to this day in, in, in recovery in a sense from that. Um, I left in in 17, you left in 18 with your, with your brother Brett who, you know, I probably should have said you. You must have been delighted when he when he got to the club. But we'll maybe look at that a little bit later. Just just in terms of that that fall off. What what are, what are your memories from from that time? And like, did you, I guess you know at the end of in and amongst twelve, thirteen, fourteen, we no one would predict that three years later we would have been in free fall. No, you wouldn't. And I was it was pretty hard to see Desi go as well. Like we, I think we'd made the finals that year, and he still got shown the door. In no, I think in seventeen we missed them. We thought we did. Yeah. Remember, remember, we played the Dragons the final round of the season, uh, and we beat the Dragons, and then the Cowboys came in. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I think we came. We may Na- have came ninth. Yeah, yeah. yeah ninth, so yeah. we just out of mm. it, and like I mean, from where we were to what we were, that was. You know, not a good season, but it wasn't. I don't. I don't think it warranted him mm. being being replaced. But um, you know, there was a lot of stuff going on at that club at that moment. There was, um, you know, board in the board fighting, and I remember like when I first got there, the the board, um, they were outstanding, and and the way that they looked after the players, um, you know, I'd probably liken it. To, to what the Roosters is like as well. They really care for their players and really look after their players. Um, but towards the back end, there was a, a lot of fighting and that kind of um, – the players didn't want to kind of associate with it or, or be involved in it and sometimes they got dragged into it and I think that was a bit unfair. You know, you had they had them asking players to hand out flyers for the board elections. Yeah. And so, like that's that's not right. I, I don't mm. – feel that's right and I don't think players should have to deal with that side of it. If you have a strong board, then, you know, normally everything else kind of filters down. So I think that kind of, you know, had something to do with with the the club, you know, going in that in that downward spiral and then obviously with, with the appointment of, of Dino as well, um, you know, he'd been under some pretty decent coaches and, um, but yeah, he probably had a squad. He inherited a squad that he probably would have liked to have changed quite a bit. 
Um, still didn't get to see that through. And, um, you know, obviously they've got Cameron there now who um, ha- have signed to a five-year deal. I really hope that he sees that out. I really hope that uh, the club support him and back him because I think he has some, you know, plans and, and visions for the club that, that can get them out of there. And the competition is in a good state when the Bulldogs are, are in the finals. I mean, you only need to look at it when we were playing and we made those finals. <laughs> Mate, we finished a training session like in that final series in the afternoon mm. or late night. We'd do a late night session and then you'd drive down to the lights at Belmore and they'd have either end of the street <laughs> locked off with car, they just pile up car, and they'd be drums, and it was just one of the best, um, you know, best times to be at that club, mm. and I still remember that. I still remember, you know, prelim finals, getting seventy thousand to a prelim final, and you know that the game's in good health when the Bulldogs are, are back in the finals, and that, and I really hope that you know it's not long before we see mm. that again. Yeah, well, I I echo your words. There. I think there's some way to be done, but they. They're certainly going in the right direction, uh, and uh, I think we're going to see very much a more competitive Bulldogs mm. for for the next couple of seasons. But in terms of y- you leaving the club, um, I'd already left. You and your brother Brett. It, it seemed as if Grub had left. Yeah, the the writing was was on the wall as well. There wasn't much. I remember you were off contract, so in terms of like renegotiation, they didn't have any room on the salary no. cap. Like, no, well they kind of said to me, look, we don't want to even offer you a deal because yeah. we can't, like we don't have any money. And out of respect for you and what you've done for the club, we're not, we just can't offer you a, a, a contract. And I said, well, that's fair enough. At least you're being honest with me. You know, we're not going to drag this long. I'll, I'll you mm. know, start looking elsewhere. And um, at that stage it was either go to England or see what my options were and, uh, it just so happened that Cronulla, you know, came to the party and um, living in Carringbar and, you know. North Carringbar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm glad you got out of the retirement village. Um, no, but it just, it, it just kind of all just, mm. you know, seemed to work and I had a young daughter at that stage um, and, and, you know, it just, it just worked and, you know, I ended up going over to, to the Sharkies and, Really enjoyed my time there. I, I spent a year and a bit there, and um, you know, I, I, do I have regrets about not going to play in England? I, I don't mm. really, because yeah, it would have been for the same amount of money, and I would have had to have uprooted my family, and you know, it mm. would have been tough, I, I think. But um, you know, obviously, the in, incentives for that would have been to to go and travel, and mm. obviously see a bit more of the world, but. Um, that's something that I'll look forward to later in, yeah. in life. In, in terms of you going um, to Cronulla, you actually got picked back into the State of Origin team during that year, didn't you? And you obviously you went on to have um, you know a number of successful seasons at the at the Roosters, where you were still playing at the top of your game. What's the key to longevity? Because again, the outside backs. It, you know, in in the middle, you, you see you, you can see players, um, you know, excel with age. It's because mm. you know if if a middle forward uses a, uh, loses a yard of pace or a couple of yards of pace. Well, that's that that but, therein but, is the difference, isn't with it? With the outside backs, it's it, you know the odds are stacked against you mm. to continue on. Like once you lose a yard, that the writing can be on the wall. But it didn't with you. So what? What do you think is the sort of the key ingredients to, to longevity in the outside backs, and, and why did you, why do you think you managed to maintain that same level of, of um, performance in the autumn years? I guess it's it's your mindset around footy as well, okay. um, and as you get older, you kind of realise that football's not the end all and the be all. Like when you get when you start having kids, you find that. Instead of being consumed just by football, you, you've got a good balance. You've, you've got a life away from football. And I feel like when you have that balance, your football becomes better because you, you, you leave it at the door. Mm-hmm. You're able to be able to turn up to training, do your job, leave it at the door, go home. And I, I, I find that helped me play better footy as I got older. Um, obviously, you, you need to recover. Yeah. You need to be, but you ne- also need to prepare. Like it, towards the back end of 
my career, I would get there an hour and a half, an hour before, and I'd be, you know, stretching, I'd be rolling, I'd be hydrating, I'd be getting physio, um, all just to all just to train for the session. Um, clubs, clubs these days are a lot better with their older players as well. Yeah. Like there are some sessions that you you don't need to be in, like at the start of the week, but you you got to make sure that when you are um, the back end of the week that you're firing and you're ready to go. So I I, I feel like clubs that are smarter like that with their older players will generally get a better performance out of their players. Um, but you still got to have that mindset. Like mm. you said, you got to when you're in when you're in that mindset, you're we're all a little bit mad, aren't we? To be able to play for that long, like I look now, I do my work. I I work on the sideline and I look at the collisions and and the and I'm sitting there hearing them going, "How did mm. I do this for 15 years? What was like?" My brain was just wired completely different yeah. to what it is now. Well, that's why young people do it. Well, yeah. the, the the ability is with the youngsters, but also but, they're probably they're wired up a little but bit. But I, I I feel like the speed as well. The mm. speed was a big thing, uh, and that and it was always, you know, you had to keep training it. Yeah, mm. yeah. Obviously, you have to keep training it and and being able to perform it again and again. And I think I feel that's kind of where football has evolved over from the start to when I finished. I think, you know, it was all about long distance running and all this stuff when we first started. Now it's all about speed, endurance and repeat efforts under fatigue. Yeah. And me and Brett kind of were really good at that as well. We were able to, you know, continue to do that kind of stuff under under fatigue and I think, you know, that had a lot to do with the way we trained when we were younger but it also had to do with our mindset as mm. well. Yeah, mindset is... Um is key in how you frame things in in any avenue of life, um, but more importantly in, in professional sport. I, I firmly believe you can make a huge difference with how you shape things, how you frame things, and, and what your mindset is. But you 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 were there at Cronulla. You spoke about how important um, your brother Brett was, and the only chance you get to do that is with rep teams. You did it at the Bulldogs for a number of years, saw how happy you were together, but then. You're thinking that's over, but then an opportunity arises at the Roosters. So how important was that for you to finish your career with Brett and also or an opportunity to finish your career with Brett, but, all, but also you, you seemed really happy there. You seemed like you had a real spark in your step. What is it about that football club um, that seems to have them excel so so frequently um, so there's two questions there josh yeah well um obviously i was at the sharkies and um you know the opportunity came up and i think it was in in the pre-season um where you know i asked asked for the release um and didn't get it um but I knew that this, uh, the Sharkies, they had a couple of salary cap issues. And what uh, at that stage, what I didn't realise as well was that um, I think it may have been, you know, February I may have asked for it, but in December they had sent an email to Dave, our manager, um, saying that if myself and Matt Pryor were willing to look for other clubs, they would let us go. Mm. And I didn't even know about that. So then we went back in and was like, well, you wanted to get rid of me in December, but yeah. now you don't want to get rid of me. And then obviously they still had their salary cap issues. So they would have been, I think they would have been playing for points, uh, not playing for points at, at a certain round or something like that. They wanted to keep me for the first five rounds. I ended up playing the first two and then going. And my first day at the Roosters, COVID hit and was hello nice to meet everyone looking forward to playing with you this weekend call back in at five o'clock that arvo rightio boys game's over don't know if it's coming back <laughs> so that was my first day at the roosters and i was like oh okay and then spent the next kind of six to eight weeks you're allowed to train yeah so you're allowed to train with one person so me and brett had a home gym at brett's house and we would get up every day and train together and then go down the field and do a run session together. Yeah, I forgot. And that, it yeah. felt like 
we were 20 again. Felt like we were just, you know, you're 18, 19, like you're a young fella coming through. You're doing this away from training to try and get to where you need to be. And by the time we got back to training, mate, we were in probably the best shape we'd both been in for, for a fair while. And that transpired to our footy as well. We, you know, we both had great years. But I think in terms of why that club is so successful, I mean, you look at their board, you know, they've, they've all been successful businessmen. And then you look at someone like Robbo, he demands success, but it's their players as well. Like blokes like Boyd Cordner, Jared, Mitch Orbison, Jake Friend, those blokes, what they've been able to do and the way that they lead with their actions. And it's all about that accountability as well. You, you don't want to go out and let those blokes down, so you want to be accountable for your for your own performance. But there are so many good people in that place that just want to see you, you succeed as well. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you know all the all the office staff because they they're they were above us and we were, we were down below. But you, it wasn't that kind of divide. You would happily go up and chat mm. to everyone and felt like there, it was just one big club and it was just a club that everyone wanted to see you succeed. So you kind of weren't just playing for yourself. You were playing for them as well and you're, you're obviously representing your family. And, um, yeah, I just really enjoyed being a part of that at that stage. And, um, yeah, we didn't quite have the success that we would have liked. Um, injuries probably played a, a big part of that, and we we lost a few players like Boydie and Brett and uh, and Friendy pretty much all retired mm. in the, in the same year. Um, but no, I I really enjoyed my footy in those last couple of years, and um, but I think there was a bit of balance there as well that that I had in my life at that stage, which which made me play really well as well. Yeah, um, you speak there about. Um, a couple of those legends of the not just the the club but of the game retiring. Yeah. The emotions, um, the scenes when um, Brett goes down in in that game, mm. and I think you know you 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 could tell like I think I was calling that game for for Fox and you could see like he knows. Yeah, yeah, he knew. He he, he knows. He knew the, the, the moment. That's it. The moment. Yeah. That had happened, he knew he, you know, pretty much said that his knee just felt like it exploded. Mm. And I rushed over to him and saw the pain that he was in and went, no, nah, this is not, not good at mm. all. And for Brett, you know, he's a pretty, pretty proud bloke. He said, they said, do you want us to get the Medicab? And he said, if this is the last thing I do on a football field, I'm walking off it yeah. and getting a Medicab. And you actually see, I score a try and... As I'm sliding in to score the try, you see him in the side getting carried off. Mm. So um, I, I, I think I got a hat-trick that night and obviously you saw the scenes when after, we came yeah. into the sheds after and we actually drove up. So I, I drove that night and, um, you know, that was a pretty emotional car ride home yeah. for the next two and a half hours. Brett making phone calls to people and you know, everyone wanting to know how he was and... Just being, just being his bro, just trying to be there for him and um, continue to be there for him in those, you know, next however long it was mm. till you know he processed what happened. And what do you say to him? Because you know, it, I, I've been there where it's it's happened to teammates yeah. and, and they know it's it. Well, the season's done, and you know, I've I've been there where some people it's like they know that this is the last time. Well, you when, just you just tell him how proud you are. But of, obviously, it's of you. different with a yeah. with your twin brother. You, you, know, you say, mate, if if this is the last game you've ever played, look at the career you've had. Yeah, you've you've played for Australia, you've played for New South Wales, you've won two premierships, you've done everything you set out to do, and there are kids out there who want to be Brett Morris when they grow up. Mm. You've you've. Changed the way a winger played the game. I, I feel, um, you know, he spanned, you know, the the noughts, the the tens and and twenties, and you know, was playing some of his best footy towards the end of it as well. I mean, just his his try scoring ability, um, the way he was able to finish tries. He, but same thing, his defence as well. You mm. know, he was 
probably underrated a little bit in that aspect. But um, yeah, you just you just told him how proud you are of him and um, another. You know, I tore my hammy in that year as well. So it was towards the the back end of the year. We were actually in COVID. We'd yeah, flown yeah. up. We'd flown up to Brisbane, so we were staying at Twin Waters. I was up there by myself. They changed the lockdown rules so my wife and kids couldn't come up. So I was up there for three months by myself and I'd torn my hammy and there was about six weeks to go. And I, I'd never torn my hammy before, but it, it didn't feel good. Like it, it, I was kind of reaching out to make a tackle and twisted my ankle and just felt it go. And I was like, oh, this is not good. Anyway, I get the scans and they're like, it's, it's a high grade too. So it's, you know, it could be six to eight weeks and it was six weeks until the finals. And I'm up there, I'm like, I just want to go home. Mm. I'm, I want to go home. I want to see my family. And you know, I text text my wife and I was like, oh, I think I want, want to come home. I'm done. She's like, have you spoken to Brett? And I'm like, no, why? And she's like, well, just give him a call and see what he thinks. So I, sure enough, I give Brett a call and Brett goes, mate, you're not going anywhere. And I go, what do you mean? He goes, well, I didn't have the chance to finish off how I wanted to. You've only torn your hammy, mate. Six weeks, you can get back. You'll be right. You want to you want to finish on the football field because you don't want to, you know, come home and then regret not doing it. So I, after that, I, you know, <laughs> had me cry and then went righty oh fair enough. And sure enough, I ended up getting back the the round before um, finals and managed to end up finishing on my own terms. We ended up getting pumped <laughs> by me. <laughs> but um, no, I was proud that speaks to mindset. That yeah, I was proud that I was able to mm. um, to get back and and finish the way I wanted. But in terms of injuries, you know, we we had a number of setbacks, and I say this to a lot of young players that kind of get their first injury. It's how you deal with it, mm. as to how well you you come back. I mean, for my hammy, it was all about getting stronger. It was it was about bridging like getting strengthening exercise, so a lot of bridging and the, and the physios would say, rightio, once you get no pain, do it three sets, ten reps, do it two or three times a day. And I was like, well, why can't I do it more? Mm. I'm not doing anything. So I would, I was just constantly just doing the strengthening exercises and ended up having to do a, a, a test where – they threw, the, threw a tennis ball at me and I had to reach down to grab it and then come back up and, and start sprinting. And Trav Toomer was the, the um, S&C coach and he had the GPS data and he's like, mate, are you serious? I'm like, what? He goes, mate, you've just done one of the fastest speeds all year out of every player. I was like, all right, well, I'm good to go. <laughs> he's like, mate, what's wrong with you? And, and that was mm. it. And I kind of attacked most of my injuries like that. I think I came back from a lot of my injuries – earlier than predicted yeah. because um, the way, you know, injuries are a part of the game. If you play long enough, you're going to get an injury, but it's how how you think about the injury and, and what you can do. And if you get told to do something and and you can do more of it, well, then why yeah. not? If it's as long as it doesn't if, if, like impact. Yeah, 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 if it's only going to help. And that's, that's kind of what I did mm. throughout my career. Yeah. Did you miss the game? I know how much football meant to you. <sighs> not really. Do you really. miss playing? Not, no, I don't. You miss you miss being around the boys, obviously. You miss that that locker room feeling, hanging around the boys and stuff like that. But in terms of the game, it it's so fast now. It it's you know they are supreme athletes now that that play yeah, but the so game. Are you. Yeah, I was, day. but I, I just you know I've had my time. Mm. I couldn't do any more than what I've done. I've, I'm really proud of the career that I've had. I don't miss pre-seasons. I don't miss waking up sore. Um, mm. I don't miss grass burns and <laughs> things like <Yeah>. that. <laughs> Got a decent you, one at the you, moment. You, mi- you miss decent fields yeah, though, by the look of your leg. Decent fields. But the, I think the only time I have missed it is when I've gone to an, to an origin mm. and, you know, that crowd – you know, when when you run out and you can feel that the crowds chant and you can feel that wave of energy just hit you and it's you're just like, oh my god, let's yeah, go! I'm fe- I'm ready to play. And you you, you, mi- you yeah. missed that a little bit, but where you think you can go back? And you're like, I'm all right. No, <laughs> it, you're, you're right. It 
it, you know, people ask, oh, you should keep like it's a, it's almost a bit of an insult to the to yeah the people that and it's a fine know, the, line. You don't want to be one of those players as well that plays a, a season too long and mm. they remember your last season being that way. You know, like I I had a really good last three years and I was mm. happy yeah. that I was able to still compete at that higher level at that age, mm. especially being outside back. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to build a time travel gymnasium. So if you've got a couple of spare parts or you want to give me an hour, I'm building one in the garage. I'm <laughs> determined to tackle time so travel. So Invisibility cloak? <laughs> invisibility cloak and time travel gymnasium. That's two things I'm working on. <laughs> um, mate, you spoke a little bit about your, your, your rep career. Um, any good tales from tours or bonding sessions? Oh, mate. Oh, there's probably none that you can really tell, but, I mean, there was always... You know, well, Gail's got a tattoo of a devil on, on his ass, and it was at, at some stage of the night the, the demon had to get sent home. <laughs> the demon normally got sent home with a belt. <laughs> and, mate, for him waking up the next... Well, he'd always agree to it, but him waking up the next morning and the bruises that you'd see on his ass, <laughs> mate, blokes would just... The metal belt buckles on, oh. oh mate, and yeah, it was just all part of it. They're just some some of the stupid stuff, but there's probably not too many that I can tell that um that yeah, I've got a few with you though. All right, well, we'll keep them under wraps. No, well, can we can we talk about one of our first? Well, well this is one of the first times that I had a session with you and and your rule, my rule, your rule. Go on. At, of four visits a beer. <sighs> so he – and they weren't – it wasn't schooners either. It was pints. Well, so we've, we've gotten down to Caring Bar Pub on a on a Saturday afternoon. I was going to say something like schooners off us, but then that would be probably a bit offensive. But, yeah, no, uh, yeah pints we, all day. Yeah. So we've, we've got down there about 1 o'clock in the Arvo. And our, our partners at that stage, they said, rightio, we're going to go out to one of the mm. nightclubs. So we said, rightio, we'll, we'll meet you there. <laughs> we have been drinking four sips of pint for, what, eight hours? Yeah, probably. <laughs> if we go into Cronulla, we walk up to this this nightclub, we walk in, we look, oh, can you see him? No, can't see him. Rightio, let's go. Can't remember the, the rest of the night anyway. I get home. Go to the shower, fall asleep in the shower. Partner at that stage comes in. Where have you been? Been in the shower. The water's cold. <laughs> I don't know how long I've been there. I asked you the next day, how'd you pull up? You go, no, I was all right. And then I, mm. I hear the story of of uh, your wife now <laughs> telling me the next day, what did you get up to? Because when I got home, there was a shoe outside the door. Then there was a shoe on the inside the door. There was a shirt on the first landing of the stairs. Mm. Then there were pants on the second landing. See, and where were you placed? Uh, on the stairs of did the you, apartment block. Did you? Didn't you headbutt the door or something and have a graze on your face as well? Maybe. No, I don't. I don't think so. Look, <laughs> I'm, I'm all. About, I'm more. I. I know, it's like I know I'm on the. <laughs> I'm on the clock. So I. I know that I'm gonna fall asleep in like a minute so i've got to start getting changed otherwise i'm gonna fall asleep in my clothes and the mm -hmm. funniest thing was though they saw us come in they were literally in mm. front of us and we couldn't see him so yeah. we <laughs> good times we weren't yeah. allowed out for a while after no, that one. no no and the bit of advice don't take four sips <laughs> no pint it's a recipe for disaster um <laughs> It, it it sure is. Hey, uh, what what are the plans for the future, Jamos? Um, you spoke a little bit about coaching. Um, if things go on the right trajectory, uh, is there anything else in the pipeline, or it's, it's just purely you've got? Oh uh, look, I'm, I'm really coaching. enjoying what I'm doing with the media kind of stuff as well. Um, obviously, still being involved in the game. Uh, yeah, mm. I, I love footy. I, I mean, I've been a fan you know, ever since I was a young boy and. I really enjoy just watching two decent teams go up against each other, but I, I really enjoy being um, still a part of the game in, in that sense w with the media and, and still be able to get to rub shoulders with some of the players and be able to interview them. I, I find that really enjoyable. Um, 
but yeah, oh, mate, maybe another kid on the way at some stage, and um, you know, just just watch them grow up there and, and be there and be present for them, and um, yeah, you know, just enjoy life. Mm. Just enjoy catch up with you for a beer every now and again. Actually, we we are due. We are actually due, aren't we? What's it? What what's the place called in Guy Me? The the Snug Inn or something like the that. Snug. It's an Irish. I went bar. there the other day. Did you? I thought that's right up your alley. Oh yeah, I've, yeah. I saw I saw your wife. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. That's what she said. Actually, yeah. Um, said tag him in. Come out. Um, no, I've frequented that place quite a few times. All right. Well, next it's, time um, you go, I'm coming. Well, all right. I'll let you know. Um, we do four questions for each and every guest. Uh, first one, the dream spine. So a one, six, seven, and yeah. nine that you, that you dream about. Yeah. Oh, this was a, a tough one. I mean, I guess just players that I've played with as well. Like, I think for the fullback, I, I kind of, you know, my dream team is kind of like blokes who have kind of changed the position mm. somewhat. So if, for the fullback and the only Queenslander in my side, Billy Slater, I mean, he was one of the best players I've played with, but his ability to attack, defend, the way he organised the defensive line, um, yeah, he he had the whole whole lot and, and you've been able to see that transfer into mm. the way he coaches as well. So Billy would have been my fullback. Um, in my 5'8 position, um, I like a, a big 5'8, a running 5'8, but also a five eight that can ball play. There was probably none other than than Freddie. Freddie was, yeah. And I used to love watching him in the Origin Arena as well. Um, and then for my halfback, there, there, it was it was pretty close. There's probably a couple of blokes. You, you, I mean, you could have had JT. Um, you could have had um, Cronk. But as I said, another bloke who changed the game, Joey. And it wasn't just his attack. It was, you know, he had all those kicks in his arsenal, but his defence as well. Like, he would always, you know, show up in defence. And, um, you know, that 2005 series in Origin when he came back and, and led him to victory, like, after not playing much footy, uh, he was he was one of the greats. So, um, and then for my hooker, um, you know, you, you could say Cameron Smith because he's the... He's probably going to go down as, as the best. But I this is kind of me growing up and, as I said, kind of the way they changed the game, Bedsy. Um, yeah, and his combination with Joey as well, um, what they did for Newcastle. Uh, they weren't a star-studded side, but, you know, with them two in the side, they were able to, to get the best out of everyone. So, um, yeah, that's my dream team. Yeah, nice. That's a, a fair spine. I am a little bit surprised you didn't pick Brett at fullback, but I mean, Billy nah, Slater. Was... <laughs> pretty... If there was a winger, uh, yeah. if there was a winger. Uh, so we got Slater, Freddie Fittler, Johns, and Badiris. Not bad. I think there's been a few that are not too dissimilar to that. Uh, if football didn't exist, what do you think you'd do? Well, I was doing a PE teaching degree at university when I first really first left school, and I'd done nearly two years of it before. Back then they weren't flexible as they yeah, are now with yeah. the athletes. So I kind of got called into the teacher's yeah. room and said, pretty much said, you have to choose between rugby league. Yeah. Because they were going to give me a kind of like a full load of university with a, with a full-time schedule of training. And I was like, that's impossible. Mm. So uh, I may have finished that, but I have done my chippies trade as well. So um, could could very well have been on the tools for... 15 or 20 years and probably still felt the same as I do now. Mate, what sort of a decision is that? You've got either uni to be a PE teacher or you can go and be a professional athlete. You mm. can't live your dream. It's a tough <laughs> one. It is a tough one. Um, a sliding doors moment that you think about? Well, oh, you probably have a whole heap through mm. your career, but I mean, obviously, when I left the Dragons, yeah, there's that sliding door moment of... Well, what would have happened if I stayed? Yeah. Would I, I, I may have won a comp in 2010 with with Wayne? Um, if I'd gone to the Roosters and played mm. 10 years at the Roosters, I, I could have won a comp there. Yeah, you know. Um, but you know, I'm happy that I went to the Bulldogs, and as I said, I'm life member of the football club there, and I'm very proud of that. Yeah, and so you should be. Um, 
the most interesting person that you've met in your life so far? Mm. Yeah, I don't know. That's a that's a tough one. I met Kelly Slater. That, like that was that was pretty cool. That I got to rub shoulders where with him. Where did you meet him? At Origin. He came into the sheds after one Origin. Oh, right. So and he kind of saw me and Brett and kind of sat himself between us and started having a chat um, to us. So that was that was pretty cool. I mean, you know, he's the best surfer in in history, I guess. And and you know, asking him a question of would he rather surf a 40 foot wave or run out here and these boys and he's like mate i'd run out here and get smashed by the <laughs> by these fellas just this isn't scary compared to what i do and you're just like wow okay well that's pretty cool and um yeah i don't know i've yeah you meet so many people yeah. along the way and, and most of them are, are are pretty decent people um i guess you, you're very fortunate to be able to rub shoulders with some people i mean i've i've met a few prime ministers in my time as well. You know, Scomo was a big Sharks fan, so got to meet him. Johnny Howard was a, was a Dragons fan, so. Um, but yeah, it's Paddy Mills. I met Paddy Mills as well. Paddy Mills, the basketballer. He's oh a yeah, yeah, really good fella. You know, um, had a, had a beer with him. So yeah, there's. I mean, mm. it's just kind of weird. like you just bump into people and they and they just want to be normal people and yeah. hang out with you and. It's well, pretty some cool. interesting get... teammates as well. Interesting teammates. Mm. Been... You do? Well, or... Oh, no, I'm just Oh, mate, in I'm general. in contact with Tim Brown quite a bit. and He's in it. Very he's interesting. Very, <laughs> he's very interesting. Corey Payne, very interesting. Corey Payne, man. very, very Caught interesting. Caught up with him. Still, uh, you know, people ask, how was, how was Corey? Yeah. I don't know. D- I don't know. Like, he was good. What's he up to? Yeah, don't, no idea. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, interesting people. Keep coming. Uh, James, actually, go on. You do have, well, you don't, you said it wasn't you, but you do have claim to the best prank played on me. And you know what I'm talking oh, about. Yeah. The changing of the number plate. Well, right. <laughs> I, I, I was part of the prank. Yes. I'm glad you brought this up because this is, this is, uh, this is a funny oh, story. Are you going to clear the air, are you? So, right. So, Josh. So, you, let's, have, on, let's have a backstory here. Okay, so yeah, the, there the, obviously few, there's a backstory. There are a few pranksters. Yeah. There were a few pranksters in, but I think David Clemmer was young and impressionable mm. and you and Grub got your hands wrapped right around him. Mm. And I was one of the blokes that didn't like pranks played on teammates, mm. didn't touch anyone's locker. Mm. And Fair my, enough. I my agree. My locker absolutely copped it. I remember that. the bottom of it was a protein tin got completely no, emptied agree. into it. I see, I'm off And then that. there was there was processed chicken in a bag <laughs> and that got thrown all in my locker. <laughs> no. Luckily, mm. they cleaned it up mm. because Th- that was, was not pretty bad. But the number plate, mate, I was I was pretty I filthy about it. But looking back at it now, it was a cracker. <laughs> well, the, the, there is a backstory. Because I thought I could have got pulled over. Mm. <laughs> there, there is a backstory. So you had your man cave. Yes, had the man cave. That uh, And look... I know a lot of people out there, they, they enjoy their man caves. Um, but I, I, I was into you about it and being like, oh, no, nah, this isn't a man cave. This is a woman cave. Like, <laughs> yeah, this ain't a real man cave. This is the woman cave. And then one day I was at um, Karela Shopping Centre just doing the shopping. And I've walked past this, like... Um, novelty. Oh, like, yeah, novelty. Like a tobacconist shop. Yeah, like a tobacconist. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And they've got these like number plates there, these fake number plates. And one of them says woman cave on it. <laughs> and I've gone, ha oh, that's funny. Take a picture, upload to send to Josh. And I've just gone, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's not send. Let's not send. Let's just keep this. And we'll, I, I was planning on trying to get access to your house and putting it up in your house. That was my like grand vision to con- contact your wife and be like, look, can I get in here and just like get this screwed <laughs> up? So <laughs> anyway, lo and behold, I've took it into training and been like saying to, t- saying to Grub, I've started, I think I sent a picture to Grub saying like, what, what about this? We let, let's get this up in, in Josh's, in Josh's man cave. So I think I've bought it to train it. And then I, I, I swear, <laughs> I swear so I think while we were actually on the field, it's been passed to Fred Seraldo. 
Yeah, and I reversed yeah. in. So you've reversed in. I've reversed Fred's in. Fred's changed your plate. The back plate. The no, back, you changed the back yeah, plate. Yeah, so you changed the back plate. So you've not seen not the seen fact that on the back yeah. of your the car. car. Said, okay. <laughs> and I, I used to have a SRT Jeep Grand Cherokee. It was a nice, nice yeah. car. I'm driving home from train and I'm getting beeped by blokes and then they're driving Mate. up next to me and going, oh. <laughs> and I'm like, what what's going on? Mate. And then I pulled into the driveway, walked to the letterbox and then walked, looked at the car and went, you motherfuckers. Mate, I I've knew, got straight I, on the phone to Tom Owen. I'm like, where the fuck is my number plate? Mate, I, like we, I could have got fucking fired. I know Who you, the fuck did it? Mate, it was, I'm <laughs> glad you brought broken. it up, mate. It was it was <laughs> right seeing you drive out the train and i nearly soiled oh. myself like i was so uh, like there was a few of us that uh, were like, yeah, oh my and god and then the whole everyone knew about it by the time i got to train mm. the next day and you with your chant warmer warmer mm, cave warmer cave warmer warmer cave, warmer, warmer cave. <laughs> off us for a fit. i was like oh and it went for about a week after mm. that and i was oh oh Luckily, Zap it was still at training. He ended up driving the, driving the plate, plate back. back there, well, that, that was afternoon. that was Freddie being stupid, oh. not putting the plate like in your bag or in or leaving it in the car. Yeah. But, but that was that was one of the all time. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you brought that up and not the time you you flipped me out of a bed when I was trying to sleep because the aftermath was that was that was Dick Dave. Yeah, I was. As as you've heard before, mm, that's what Hopper brought up. Yeah. Dick, Dick Dave, Dave but, smashing yeah. you. I was, I was asleep in bed and you 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 <laughs> flipped me out of the bed. So what happened? We'd been out. We'd had yeah. a trial in in Brisbane. Yeah. And we we'd gone out for a couple of well, beers. No, we were in. No, no, we weren't. In yeah, we were in Brisbane, and we'd gone out for a couple of beers. And Grub and and um, Hocko were on the bed, and they're like, "Just flip him over, just flip him over." And I'm mm. gone. Come on, look, like, he's gonna go psycho. So I've done it once, and you've gone. Don't you dare do that ever again. <laughs> you pop back in bed. <laughs> Put your shoes up like this. And I've gone, no, nah, he's getting it again here. And I've flipped you. And as I've flipped you, you've head butted the side table. <laughs> and all I can describe is the next minute of just I had like I was terrified. Yeah. You walk to the to the fridge and you had this look in your eyes and you looked at me and I had just hid behind the bed while you just pegged the whole yeah. contents of the fridge towards my direction and mm. your finishing move was the best move I've ever seen. You got two two bottles and threw them up, they hit the roof and you walked through the water and the glass. And then you just went straight back to bed and went to sleep like nothing had happened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to deny that. It what was I would a minute like to of say madness. Is there is that I, that there was the, I don't think there was any damage to the hotel room, but we did clean up after. Yeah. So I think that <laughs> that's important to get that out there. But yes, yeah. I, I I I remember pelting the cans at yeah. I can't remember throwing the bottles up and walking through the dripping down beer. But um, it was one. Of, yeah, it was a minute of madness. Yeah. But yeah, I learned. I need. I, I like learned say, not I, to do it again. Yeah, I, I need my sleep. <laughs> I need my sleep. Well, I'm glad those both those stories are out there. It's a great way to well, finish you, it up. You got to you got to pull got, something out for you, mate. Yeah, you can't you, just sit there and dish it out. I know. All right. Well, Jamos, <laughs> it's been uh, it's been great to sit and chat with you, mate. It's um, it was um, a pleasure to to take the field with you and, and call you a teammate. And I've, I think you know something I'm taking from this is, is just about that centre position and what goes into to being a, a good centre. I think anybody listening um, listening out there that's got aspirations to, to play on an edge can take a lot from that. And m more importantly, that is, um, is the mindset. And it, especially with little things like injury, you've overcome a lot of setback. You were the best centre in the game for a number of years and there's no um, there's no surprises with that because uh, I saw the amount of hard work and dedication that you put into that. So uh, thanks very much for, for joining us on the buy round, mate, and I'm, uh, we'll have that beer very, very soon. No worries, mate. That's probably the nicest thing you've ever said about me, so I'll leave it on that. Man, I might poke your leg now. <laughs>